All right, this is NBA Big Board Mock Draft Week. I started off with my mock draft and then Leaf did his. And today it is Sam's turn to present you with his mock draft. If you know Sam, you know there's going to be some surprises here. Stay tuned. <laughs> Big, big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. And this episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to and faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. I am Rafael Barlow, your host and the director of Scott for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. And my co-host for today is Mr. Sam Ferris, the man behind the draft dummies, but he is far from a dummy. Sam, what's going on in your world? Doing well. Um, spent the day driving today, so kind of got a makeshift uh, set up here, but excited to talk hoops. We've gotten to see a few more of the college freshmen with especially Nick Smith and Cam Whitmore playing a little bit more so stay tuned and you'll find out where i've got those guys on my first big board reveal today all right so you drove from salt lake to vegas yep as, as a person yeah. that lives in texas and grew up in the midwest in omaha nebraska and went to college in mississippi i didn't grow up with any scenery yeah. <laughs> so um i i you know, it's always cool to me when I go to Vegas and I've driven through Utah. I mean, it's so much scenery and mountains and even like driving through Arizona, man, it's I, I envy you in a sense yeah. because you, you got scenery when you drive. Yeah. Driving from Dallas to Omaha, man, it's it's absolutely nothing to look at, especially that Kansas Turnpike, if anybody knows about that. All right. So your your mock draft and I feel like I know you well enough to know that there's going to be some surprises here. <laughs> but before we yeah. get into your to your lottery, who are some of the names that did not make your top 14 that are that's probably going to surprise some people? So we'll start with the Duke freshman. Uh, I have Dariq Whitehead at 19 right now, and I have Derek Lively at 21. Uh, and then also right outside the lottery, I have Keontae George right at 15. But to me, like when I look at the Duke freshman, it's we can be talk. A good episode. Yeah, it's you say a good episode. <laughs> you want to talk Keontae George, we can do that too. But I, I just don't know how you can really have Whitehead or Lively much higher than that right now. Like I, I watched the pre college stuff with them, I was lower than most on Whitehead coming into the year. And I know he's he's working back from injury, so you have to take it with a bit of a grain of salt, but he's shown very, very little so far. Just not looking very bursty. The shot hasn't gone in. He's posted a massive negative BPM. So stat wise, hasn't been good. Eye test has not been great either. Lively has hardly played. I posted a stat on Twitter that so far, through all their games, Dariq Whitehead and Derek Lively have combined together for just one double scoring game between them. It's just been very unproductive. So those have been the guys that have disappointed. And I've seen other mocks that are still relying heavily on the pre-college stuff and still have them in the top 10. But as I was a little lower on both in combined with what I've seen so far, I, I just can't get much higher on those guys. So that's where I'm at with those two. But Keontae George, I was a little bit higher on, and he's a guy that I've dropped out of my lottery as well. All right, let's talk about the Duke guys first. Yeah. Or even just in general. Are you someone that weighs heavily on what you see in college, or do you go by what you see prior to college? Because I know there's some people that take the what they've seen prior to college, they hold it with higher value because, I, and I've heard somebody say, in high school, you see everything a player can do. And then in college, you kind of see they're basically trying to fit into the system of, of their school. Which is more valuable to you? 
I'd say college is more valuable to me just because I get to see a lot more and because of the competition they're playing against generally. I use high school just to get a feel for a general range in preference on the just to get a picture on them before I get to see them in college. Um, but there's some good examples because like we're going to talk probably later in this episode of Gigi Jackson versus Jairus Walker, where right now we're getting to see Gigi Jackson do kind of whatever he wants for South Carolina, whereas Jairus Walker has to play a specific role for a really good team. But if you watch Jairus Walker before college at IMG, you got to see him handle the ball, pass it more. Yep. And so I, I still I'll spoil a little bit ahead. I have them back to back. And I think some people would be surprised because I think Gigi Jackson has popped a little bit more in college, but I saw what Jairus Walker did previous to college. And I think that if given the opportunity, he could do a lot of what Gigi Jackson's doing right now at South Carolina. So that's kind of one example, but I do rely more on college because it's just a larger sample versus better competition. But pre-college is still very useful to get it's another perspective on these guys in a different role. And I just use it to get a good picture and sense for where I'm going to be on them. Yeah, I agree. I'm a guy that leans more towards college. A lot of times in high school, guys can dominate because they're bigger, stronger, faster, more athletic, more gifted. And then it, the the field gets, I mean, it evens out a little bit in college, but then I also like to see in high school, um, to see how they play with more freedom and just different skill sets. I know like one of the biggest examples I can think of is um, Damian Collins at Kentucky. At Kentucky has a very limited role as just, you know, a rim runner or, you know, a roller. But when I watched his high school film, and I wasn't a big fan of his high school film, but he shot a lot of jumpers. He showed that he could not necessarily, he wasn't a great ball handler, but I felt like he was a guy that I wasn't high on because I thought he was a four that tried to play too much like a wing. Mm -hmm. But at Kentucky, he's not showing any of those wing oh. skills at all. <laughs> so um, if I never paid attention to his pre-college film, I would have never seen that. And you can say the same for, for Jairus Walker. All right, so let's let's talk about Whitehead. So I, I had a an agent tell me, and his his exact words were, "I mean, he looks like a football player." And I said, "Oh, you know, his brother played football." He had no clue that his brother played football, but he was saying he just looked heavy footed, yeah. and he had mentioned that he didn't watch a lot of him prior to college, so he was wondering what was all the hype about. And his question to me was, "Has the foot injury been that bad to where it makes him look that slow?" And he didn't think that he separated well. And there are other people that still say, oh, he's, you know, he's coming back from injury. And there are some that compare him to Benedict Matherin. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I've talked about this a little bit in the past. And the comp that I use for him just athletically, and I said this before college, is he reminds me physically. Now, they're different sizes, but the way he moves reminds me a lot of Harrison Barnes and not necessarily in the best way. And, and the reason why I say that is because you look at him physically, he's well built. And if you watch him just in a straight line or when he has time to gather and dunk, it, it looks good. But he's, he's kind of heavy footed, like you said, he doesn't change direction very well. And like, you know how white guys are always called like sneaky athletic? Mm -hmm. Well, he's kind of like, unsneaky bursty like he's not as bursty as he looks and just that heavy footed he's got to load up to jump doesn't change direction and i was really interested to see that's kind of why i was lower on him coming in i already was skeptical of him athletically in that way and so i really was interested to see how he would measure out in terms of the functional athleticism versus acc opponents and we're going to give him more Time because he's coming back from that foot injury so it looks even a little worse than even I expected but he's just he's the functional athleticism is not as good as a guy like Benedict Matherin and in my opinion it never really has been so he's been kind of what I expected but even a little bit below that hopefully because of the foot injury yeah and I'm not high on, on lively either he is 
he looks the part. I mean, he has the size and he has the physical tools. I don't know what he does great. Like for me, when I look at bigs, I either want you to be like this really gifted Alperin Shingun low post yeah. scorer that has post moves and counters on top of counters, or I want you to be like this incredibly active vertical lob threat <laughs> or either a pick and pop guy, like a guy that can space the floor. And just from my personal taste, he doesn't fit any. He has flashes of, you know, of each of those. Well, I mean, not not the post game. I don't. I don't think he's a post guy. guy. Yeah. But I don't know. I, I don't know exactly what he does. Yeah, yeah. And just on top of the physical tools, there are like, there's a lot of things I look at, but kind of three main things with bigs. Number one, like, how is their feel for the game because a lot of times bigs that are that athletic you know maybe they just play basketball because they're that big but there are guys that truly do love basketball and you can see that feel so that's one thing i look for number two how are how are their hands like can they catch the ball in traffic because a lot of the bigs struggle to do that and then the third one is even though they're big do they play with physicality or yeah. are they kind of soft and so those are the three kind of checklist items that I look at with Lively. The the key one to me is the third one. Like I've said this before coming into college, I don't think he's a guy that plays with a ton of physicality, even though he's got like the, the height. And so I'm worried about that. Um, his feel for the game, I'm still undecided on, but it's certainly not like fantastic. And he's just not even playing a lot of minutes right now for Duke. And so that's kind of a little bit concerning as well. I've seen people now start to speculate already is he coming back for a second year and as a guy that was the number one prospect coming in I didn't have him ranked that high but I, I'm certain that he was a guy that expected to be a one and done yeah and even nowadays you have to and we've talked about it before if you're that highly rated and you go to a top program like Duke you really have to weigh the factors of all right if I'm not going to be a first round pick if I'm a second round pick, I have to really have faith that my agent is going to be able to negotiate some guaranteed money because there are guys that were drafted in the, I want to say high 30s, that ended up on two-way deals. You can probably make just as much money at a, a blue blood school if you stay. So much more to talk about. I do want to touch on Keontae George a little bit, but when we return, we'll talk about Keontae George, and then we will also get into Sam's Lottery. But I want to talk to you, especially you that have businesses about LinkedIn jobs, because these days, every new potential hire, it can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100 percent certain that you have the access to the best qualified candidates available, which is why you have to check out LinkedIn jobs. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. So all you need to do is add your job and the purple hashtag, which is purple ha hashtag hiring. Frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you are hiring. So hashtag hiring, you add that to your LinkedIn profile and people will know that you are hiring. So simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and more importantly, who you'd like to hire. It is why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs. It helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to and faster. So post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on NBA. That is LinkedIn.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right. Once again, thank you for making the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. Now for your second listen, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today, available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcast. This is Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Blue, but more importantly, your host for today, and Sam Ferris, Mr. Draft Dummies, who is breaking it down on a few prospects that a lot of people are high on that he may not be as high on. And one of the guys that you mentioned is outside of your lottery that I have seen on everybody's lottery. I have him in my lottery is Keontae George. 
Mm-hmm. I'm gonna need you to explain why you're not as high on Keontae George. Yeah, so I was I had him in like this uh I don't know, eight to twelve range or so, probably coming into the year. There's a lot of combo guards to sort through in this class, and so that's kind of one of the interesting subgroups to look at. But with him, I think the way I'd classify it, explain it is I think actually better than I expected defensively. And as a passer, which I expected him to look good defensively at Baylor because they demand that. And I think he was an underrated passer even. But in order to be a top 10 pick for me, he had to really hit as a scorer, which which I think is the area that he has been a little below expectations. And just the reason is that he's not athletic for a six foot three, six foot four guard. And there are other ways you can make up for it with elite skill level and and stuff like that. But as I've watched him so far, like you look at the numbers, he's under 40% from the field, just 33% from three. I think think the three point number is going to come up, but just from an eye test perspective and from a projecting perspective to the NBA, it just looks hard for him to get good shots. It just looks like he's not able to create a lot of separation. And so I'm just worried whether he's going to be a great offensive player at the next level as an undersized guard. Is he going to be able to create advantages and set up teammates or create space to get off good shots at the next level? And as an undersized-ish guard, I think he's got to be really, really good offensively because I don't think he's going to provide a ton of value on the defensive end at the NBA level and so I I just don't think he's kind of met that standard of a great offensive prospect to this point in my opinion and so I just have him one spot outside of the lottery I'm willing to move him back up if if things change but it's more more than statistically it's just a little bit of a concern I test wise that it just looks everything looks difficult for him at this point offensively in terms of creating his own shot. And so that's a bit of a worry for me projecting to the next level. All all valid points. I do think he is a better athlete than he has shown. Well, I'll say this. He is a guy that I think is a good athlete, but his game is not based off athleticism at all. And I remember having this debate with, with somebody a few months ago, he talked about how he wasn't athletic at all. And I sent him a, a video of him jumping over, a kid that was like six five and 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 Duncan. I mean, of course, yeah. it was you know with a running start and with a runway, but he was awed by it. And I was like, I've seen him, you know, in, in AU games take off and and dunk. It's weird because he just doesn't base his game off athleticism. And one of the reasons why you may be a little bit lower on him is a reason why he's kind of stayed exactly where he's at for me because I think the shooting is going to come along. Um. I felt like there was going to be a big adjustment period for him because he basically plays the same position as the two other Baylor guards who are their leading scorer. And I was just wondering how he was going to really get freedom when he is coming on, not necessarily saying it's a real veteran team, but they don't have a lot of young guys. But I was just wondering, like with the two guys that are their two leading scorers coming back that play similar positions, I was wondering, like, is he going to have to fall in line and be like a third option behind those guys? And even then, I mean, it's valid. He's not shooting lights out. But I think that he has answered some of the biggest concerns about him, which was defense and passing. And I think once the shooting takes off, then I think he's he's going to be fine. Yeah, so that's a good question. And I'll ask a question as well. You can answer this if you want, but it's also just for the listeners to think about is, Jaden Hardy went in the second round last year. Mm-hmm. Is Keontae George like really 35 picks better than a guy like Jaden Hardy? Now, some people thought he should have gone higher. And 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 so this is just kind of a, a question to think about. But for me, when I look at the value there, I don't see like a huge difference. Now, I do think Keontae George is a little bit better defensively. But again, I, I just don't see... 35 picks difference there and especially when we're talking about small guards the line of success at the NBA level is it's a thin one you have to be really good offensively and I think he can do that but just something to think about 
Yeah, and I had tweeted a I guess it was early last week that if Keontae George has the same exact numbers as Jaden Hardy did last year, he still is going to get drafted higher than Hardy, despite the fact that people think the G League is better. Nobody has really been able to give me a valid reason why Hardy fell so low. And then, you know, the math sent him down to the G League and he was tearing it up. He was killing. <laughs> and that that's still really weird to me of how a guy that some people thought was going to be a top five pick coming into the season falls into the 30s despite putting up good numbers in the G League against what's supposed to be better competition. I mean, it's it's a big it's a big mystery to, to me. So that is a very valid question. All right, when we return, we'll have to get to Sam's lottery. I mean, this discussion has been so good, we haven't even had an opportunity to talk about it. All right, when we return, we'll get right into the 14th pick. Stay tuned. All right, once again, it's Rafael Barlow with Sam Ferris. And, man, you know, I can chat with Sam talking hoops for hours, but we don't want to take up too much of your time. All right, so 14th, who is – did you do teams or is it just – uh, no, I, I just went in order, and I'll give you my 14th, but actually I think the my two big surprises are at 13 and 11, so I'll give you those as well. But I had Kellel Ware at 14 out of okay. Oregon, but then at at 13 and 11, so at 11 I have Maxwell Lewis out of Pepperdine, no. who I think, I think in a few weeks everyone is going to have him in their lottery. I mean, if you just look at the numbers he's putting up right now, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, and then at 13, this is kind of projecting for a few weeks or months down the line. Nobody else has him there right now, but I think he's a guy that's going to continue to move up. That's Julian Phillips out of Tennessee. And the reason I say that with Phillips is because he's shot the ball terribly from three, like 17% right now. And I just think short sample size, an easy way to find guys that might be underrated guys that have just shot the ball poorly early on and we expect that to regress back to the mean like if he had just made a few more threes at, through the first few weeks of the season I think he'd be talked about a lot more because he's another big wing which is what all NBA teams want defensively he's looked the part if you watch the games I think just eye test wise he looks really good but steals and blocks he's getting them like everything else looks good besides the shooting so I think he to me is a guy that as the shooting regresses to the mean he's a guy that kind of one of my calls early on in the year that I think is going to rise up some boards and then Maxwell Lewis is he's a guy that was a sleeper for me I listed him as a top five returning prospect and he's been just awesome statistically he's shooting like over 50% from three, like over 60% from the field, tons of steals and blocks, another like six foot seven athletic wing. And those are the guys that I think the NBA values. And so I, I try to place the value on that as well. So those are kind of two of my sleeper-ish guys that I think are going to continue to rise over the next few weeks. So I, I just want to get a little in early on, on their stock. Yeah, Maxwell Lewis is a guy that I like. I didn't have him in my first round. And I'll be honest, I haven't had a chance to really watch him this year. So my question to you is, and it sounds like he's been pretty efficient, has the shot selection improved? That was like my biggest knock on him last year was the shot selection was poor. And he had this tendency, and this is just my opinion, but he had this tendency to turn down easy looks for a tougher contested shot. So has the passing improved? I mean, I'm sorry, not the passing, but the uh, shot selection. Pass selection. Yeah, so I think it has a little bit. I'll, I'll quickly give you his stats. Uh, 18 points per game, 5.6 rebounds, 2.6 assists, but the shooting splits, 62 and a half from the field, 53 from three and 80 from the free throw line. So he, he's taking a little bit better shots, but he's also still hitting difficult shots. He hit, He's hit a few step back threes recently. He's shooting it well off the catch, but it's kind of all going in for him right now. Now, they haven't played that many good teams. They've played a lot of cupcakes to start the year, so we do want to see him against better competition. But he was a guy that I already really liked based on 
kind of some of the underlying analytics and just his physical tools last year, and he's even exceeded that this year. I don't expect the numbers to stay this good, but like again, every NBA team is looking for an athletic six seven wing that can play defense and shoot, and I think he has a little bit more just creation or just game to him than just three and D as well. So there's just a lot of untapped potential there. And to your point, I think he has improved a little there, but we're going to have to see even more against better competition. I would say. Does he look like Troy Murphy or Trey, not Troy, yeah. Trey Murphy to you physically? <laughs> not quite Troy Murphy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally uh, Trey, yeah. Trey Murphy is bigger. So one of the kind of, worries or things I'm going to look for with Maxwell Lewis because he's listed at 6'7", but I just have this worry with 6'7 wings. It's kind of like the Isaac Okoro thing where he was listed at 6'6". Then you saw Isaac Okoro in the NBA and you're like, oh crap, he's only six foot four. <laughs> he, yeah. He's not big enough to actually guard real wings. So I'm interested to see does he measure like six foot five or is he legit six, seven? So he's not as big as Trey Murphy, yep. but he's more athletic. He's more um, just kind of like nimble and active defensively as well, but he's not quite the same size. All right. Number 12, you skipped number 12. So we did yeah, yeah. 14, 13, 11. Who do you have at number 12? So another big wing, but this is a guy that everyone loves right now is Brandon Miller. And I had him right here at 12 or 13 coming into the year. So a guy that I, I liked and I, I think I was a little bit ahead on. Similar vibes, like everyone's talking about to Jabari Smith, where the shot looks really good. He's a little bit, he's got a little bit more bend and off the dribble game to him than Jabari <laughs> did last year. Bend. But still, I like that. Yeah. Because like, Jabari seems like he's he straight up. Have that. Straight up, yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, he's got great posture. He, he, he does. He's very straight up and down. Yeah. But similar concerns. I, I don't see a ton of like off the dribble creation in the future, but I see a really good shooter with good size who's already producing at the college level. So late lottery is where I'm at with Brandon Miller. He's still the most divisive guy. I mean, some people are high on him as number three. And now, I mean, even like the biggest skeptics have, have him in at least the, at the back end of the lottery. I just think for him, if he finished better at the rim, it seems like he just has the tools and athleticism to be a three-level scorer, but he just scores right now at the three. Yeah. And he was a really good mid-range shooter in high school. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, that's kind of like taken away from his game, which is more so based off of how Alabama plays. But I'm just curious to see if he adds a little bit more at the rim. All right, who is number nine for you? Um, so 10 was Gigi Jackson, nine Jarris Walker. We talked a little bit about yep. them. I like them both. Um, Gigi Jackson's even moved up for me just because of the off the dribble flashes that he's shown so far this year have yep. been really enticing. You really like Gigi, so I'm preaching to the choir here, but top 10 for me there. And then uh, six through eight are kind of the other combo guards where I don't really feel fantastic about having any of them there, but I've got Nick Smith six, Anthony Black seven, Kaysen Wallace eight. Anthony Black has moved up for me since the last time we talked about him. He's just started to play and show yeah. more. <laughs> uh, we were a little bit lower on him and he, he came out and proved us wrong over the last few weeks. Looking better scoring now still needs to take a little bit more initiative he can we saw him take the back seat again a little bit more offensively when nick smith came back but with that size and def defensive ability and then just the athleticism i i have him there at seven so i don't really feel great about nick smith at six really i i just don't feel that confident mike jones who is an avid listener that comments is going to hate that i had well, a match why do you say that Oh, because he thinks Nick Smith should go number two. I think he okay. he believes Nick is better than Scoot. So oh, yeah. uh, I can't get there. <laughs> he'll he'll be in in the comments. I think uh, I forgot. I think I had Nick at seven on mine, and he asked me, "Was I trolling?" So well, <laughs> number six is still pretty high. I feel like that's kind of average right now. It, it's hard to have him that much higher, just because he's coming back from injury. So we got to see a little bit more. But. Yep. All right. And what are your thoughts on Casey so far? So. 
I think he's kind of safe-ish just because the defensive floor with him as an NBA player is really good. And that's what separates him from some of these other combo guards is even though he's six foot four, he's got long arms. He's like kind of has that stocky build so he can guard up the lineup. I think in the NBA, you can put him on a lot of wings. And I think that differentiates him from a lot of other combo guards. Um, and so I hate to overuse the Drew Holiday comp, but he just <laughs> has that physical build, right? He looks like him. I'm not saying he's going to be that level of defender, but he does have that build and those tools at 6'4 with the long arms, stocky build. And he kind of just moves around like him too. And he just gets a ton of steals as well, which is a good indicator. And then offensively, I he's a good shooter. And I think he's not going to be best as like a primary, but as a guy that can play off of maybe a bigger primary uh, initiator. So it's just like a secondary guy attacking off the catch or hitting catch and shoot. But that's that's valuable. And that's like an easy piece to fit into a good team, which I value as well. So that's kind of where I'm at with Case and Wallace. Yeah, I spoke to a scout and it was in an article I wrote a few weeks back. And he said that he thinks that a... GM is going to pass him because he's not may not be like the sexiest prospect and they may go for a guy that they think has more upside while he said every coach is going to want Case and Wallace because obviously a coach wants to win yeah. right now and Case and can come in and defend. All right, so your top 5, well we know who your top 2 are. Obviously yep. Wimbin Yama Wimbin Yama number 1, Scoot number 2. All right, so three, four, and five. I'm guessing there's a some some family members that are on that list. <laughs> so I I have uh, I do have the twins. I have Osar Thompson, and then I'm men. So I have them back to back at four and five. Um, and it's just a little weird to me. I guess where I differentiate from most is I see most have Amen at like three or four, and then Osar down at like the end of the lottery. And I personally don't see that much difference in their games. And if you just think about the fact that they're twins, it's like, that's kind of a weird conversation to have, but they kind of have the same DNA. So it's kind of weird to me that you'd have one. But anyway, when you look but at you know their what? actual... Just, just to, sorry to cut you off there, uh -huh. but we've seen it happen. We've seen we have, like yeah. the Lopez twins, <laughs> like totally yeah. different players. Um uh, and then Taylor, the Morrises. The Mo well, I think they're kind of similar players. They started off similar. Yeah, they did. <laughs> but um, someone else, I think the Taylor Hendricks, who I'm a big fan of out of Central Florida, he has a twin yeah. brother, and they're, and they're totally uh, different. But, yeah. but yeah, I um, I, I agree with you. I have Osar sixth, and I, I mean, I, I couldn't end up even moving up higher. He's shooting forty two percent from three. I don't know if that's sustainable. Yeah, but if it is you might have to put him over Amin because I think the passing is not that far apart. It's just one has the ball in his hands a whole lot more. Yeah, I think theoretically people like Amin is just more of like the creator upside off the bounce, like the flashy passing. And so I get him having that higher ceiling that people want to reach for, but it feels like we're going to look back a year from now and it's like, yeah, but Osar is the better shooter he's the more ready-made guy right now and it's it's a lot closer than than people think and so i personally have them back to back and i think people are starting to move them closer together but then i have cam whitmore at three which some people have him that high but i think that's a little bit of a medium hot take i, I would say but to me he's clearly the best freshman in college basketball right now he's just He's got a lot of the tools that I love in a prospect. He's he's wing-sized. He's both athletic, but also has a strong build. I believe in the shot long-term. A good motor. <laughs> a good motor. He plays with physicality. He's also a smart player as well. And I trust the projection of the shot, but he also just has that knack for scoring. But also, I like his defensive tools. So it's like, what does he, what does he really take off the table there really isn't anything and so that's why i had him like one of my stronger takes that i talked about coming into the year was i had him above the thompson twins and that was something that differentiated me from most and i'm i'm sticking with that and he's looked really good kind of 
different from Whitehead and even Nick Smith, who have taken a bit to kind of ramp up coming back from injuries. Whitmore played today against, it was against Penn, but he looked really, really good. And so that's a take that I'm pretty stuck in with is having Cam Whitmore number three overall. I like that. Well, thank you so much. We know who one and two is. Thank you, the listener, for making this NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. Now, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast, the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Rafael Barlow. He is Sam Ferris. Gave you his mock draft. And we are out.